Funding for this program is provided by Annenberg CPB to advance excellent teaching. Was it the beginning of a new modern world, a world of imagination, action, enterprise, or was it the culmination of the Middle Ages which had lasted for nearly a thousand years, or was it a bit of both? The Renaissance and the Age of Discovery, this time on the Western tradition. And now UCLA professor Eugen Weber's continuing journey through the history of Western civilization. I told you a few programs back that the Middle Ages were invented by the Renaissance. But the Renaissance was invented by itself. I don't mean that people in the 14th or 15th century conjured up the word, but they acted as if they might do so at any time because they felt so excited by what was going on around them. Now, part of what was going on was the same old mess as before and after, wars, injustice, violence, misery. What we call the Renaissance, after all, ran from about the 14th century through the 16th. So it overlapped the late Middle Ages for more than a hundred years. But there was an important difference. There were serious economic problems, but there was more enterprise, more wealth, more leisure in the Renaissance, and also more competition in the conspicuous consumption that went with wealth and leisure. And one form of consumption that especially soared was culture culture which adored and pursued antiquity with an extraordinary urgency and passion. Their literature and architecture and visual arts soared and their achievements made contemporaries feel that they lived in a time when men were at last on the way to recapture the greatness of the ancients. Those ancients against whom the West had measured itself for 1,000 years. If you want to be objective, the West had been reviving since the 12th century at least. The great cathedrals hadn't waited for the 14th century, and previous generations had translated the Greeks, had studied philosophy and the laws of nature, had made technological improvements. In the 13th century, better chimney construction made heating more flexible and thus made privacy possible for the better off. The chimney probably affected the art of love more than the troubadours did, and it fostered more individualism than Renaissance philosophers did. And without another contemporary invention, eyeglasses, we probably would have had fewer philosophers anyway. Among other inventions of the 12th century was the spinning wheel, which not only made yarn cheaper, but also suggested the use of a belt to transmit power. And the wheelbarrow, which cut in half the number of people needed to haul small loads by substituting a wheel for the front man. And even the button, which revolutionized the history of clothing. So the Middle Ages was often innovative and increasingly productive. But what changed most in the 14th century was the mood perhaps because what was being done, 
was less to the glory of God and more to the glory of man. You can see this in literature where the rebirth of ancient Latin and ancient Greek revived the Greek belief in man as the measure of all things and introduced subversive notions of a life unencumbered by revealed religion. It's characteristic that this secularizing spirit was represented by men and sometimes by women who called themselves humanists because they were interested in human nature and human values. To put it differently, they were trying to discover the secret of the good life, the virtuous life. And they thought they could find it not in the centuries just past, where no model seemed to fit their bill, but by looking back at antiquity. If you read Seneca or Cicero, and if you wrote like them, then you could hope to become as good, as great as they had been. So the humanists revived the classics and they studied and they taught them in the humanities which were supposed to teach you to be good that is virtuous and honorable in private and especially in public. The humanities stressed personal judgment, the worth and possibilities of individuals, man's free will, his superiority over unformed, unpolished nature, his duty to society and they are at the origins of the classical curriculum which was going to last into the 20th century. The typical Renaissance humanist was a professional scholar. Today, he would be a professor. Like many professors, a lot of humanists were chiefly interested in splitting hairs or coming out with learned quotes. But also, like some professors, humanists wanted to prepare their students and readers to operate wisely in the world. Ideally, most of these students would be princes or courtiers or men and women who exercise some power around them. Certainly, they would have to be educated because they had to know Latin. One of the most famous humanists of the Renaissance was a Dutch monk, Desiderius Erasmus, who lived from 1466 to 1536. When he wasn't editing texts, Erasmus dedicated himself to teaching morals and culture, good manners, common sense, civility, and the Christian virtues, all of which were as signally lacking in his day as they are today. But I prefer one of his Italian contemporaries, Niccolo Machiavelli. Machiavelli was a less erudite man, but more inclined to think for himself and what this produced. You can see if you read his little book, The Prince. Machiavelli has been much condemned as cynical and immoral because his book describes power politics as they are and not as they should be. But Machiavelli had a lot of experience with politics in one of the most politicized cities of the time, Florence. This is the court of Lorenzo the Magnificent who ruled the city when Machiavelli was growing up there. In the mess that followed Lorenzo's death, Machiavelli learned to consider politics as a jungle where the strong take what they can, the weak go to the wall, and ordinary people fare better under strong rulers than under weak ones. In a way, Machiavelli simply described what he saw around him. More important, though, he separated metaphysics from politics. Religion or morality or law became just another factor of political action, like armies 
like taxes. And this was a radical break from medieval tradition. But apart from Machiavelli, and perhaps I should add Thomas More, most humanists have little to say to us today. Their writings are not very readable. They're overstuffed with classical references and quotes. It's much more exciting and much more accessible to trace the new spirit of the Renaissance in the visual arts, which really illustrate the vigor and the excitement of the time and its focus on human possibilities. You can begin to see the change by contrasting the great mosaics of the 11th and 12th centuries with the work of Giotto, who lived during the late 13th and early 14th centuries in Florence in the early days of the Renaissance. Many of Giotto's contemporaries still created great majestic hypnotic figures of authority and power or else they painted puppet shows in the impersonal Byzantine manner full of lifeless mannequins in splendid attire. But Giotto's work was affected by the new revival of classical ideals and especially by the new humanity that St. Francis had brought to religion. Giotto's approach was emotional and urgent, unlike the stiff manner of the Middle Ages, it expressed a new humanity. So Giotto was innovative, but he was also profoundly Christian and medieval. Characteristically, his best-known paintings can be seen in a chapel in Padua called the Scrovegni Chapel because it was built by the son of a usurer of that name. Old Mr. Scrovegni was so notorious that Dante placed him in one of the circles of hell in the Inferno. So here you have a typical medieval act of redemption. The usurer's son holds out his chapel in a propitiatory gesture to make up for the ill-gotten family wealth. Now compare this with a picture painted in 1434, 100 years after Giotto's death, Jan van Eyck's portrait of Giovanni Agnolfini and his wife. We are in Bruges, but the subject is an Italian merchant and his young bride. We are in the house of a businessman and a moneylender like Scrovegni, but the couple is presented as if they were nobles and they make no apologies for their money. And look at the realism and the precision of presentation, which are in keeping with the rationality of a new, more secular society. Fifty years go by, and Botticelli is painting his birth of Venus in Florence around 1485. By this time, spiritual concerns have been drained out, not from all life, of course, far from it, but from this painting. All Botticelli seems to care about is sensuousness and recreating the ancients. He takes an ancient subject, he tries to paint it as the ancients would have done, and he revels not in spiritual, but in sensuous beauty. Then, Another 50 years go by, and Michelangelo paints the Last Judgment on the altar wall of the Sistine Chapel, finishing in 1541. It's an overwhelming composition, and the best thing really is just to look at it and gasp. I mention it here because it's so different from any kind of medieval Christian spirit of hierarchy or order. And in the same room, there are also frescoes that Michelangelo painted a quarter century earlier. These are about the creation. 
and they look to me like a powerful, explosive affirmation of man. So in these two works, the Renaissance has really supplanted the Middle Ages. When he painted The Last Judgment, Michelangelo was an old man in his 60s. Rome had been sacked and pillaged a few years before, and the old sense of unlimited possibilities had started to crack. But the thing that strikes me is that whether in a vision of torment, doubt, defeat, or in a vision of affirmation, you can find here in a Vatican chapel at the center of Western Christendom, you can find here one of the ongoing themes of the modern Western world. Man is great. He's always in trouble, but he's the most impressive thing we've got. And this is a theme you wouldn't have found 400 years before. This greatness of man was going to be proved and accelerated in another way by the invention of printing from movable type, which occurred in Germany around 1445 and which we attribute to a goldsmith called Gutenberg. By 1480, over 110 European towns had printing shops. And by 1500, about 20 million books had been printed. And the 16th century was going to see at least 10 times more than that. The humanists quickly realized the advantage of cheaper and more numerous books. So did the church. At first, most of the books were for clerks and clerics anyway. And most of them were in Latin which meant that access to reading was limited. But by the 16th century, this changed. Magistrates, burghers, tradesmen owned books, often in their own language. A publishing industry grew up to cater to more simple people with pious books and entertaining books and almanacs and chivalric romances of adventure and glory were turned out in vast numbers by Italian and Spanish printers who fed the dreams of future conquistadores. And in fact, during the 15th century and the first half of the 16th, the Renaissance, a period of intense and passionate cultural achievement, was going to coexist with the age of discovery, a period of fervent expansion. Just as there had never been so much variety and creativity in the arts, so too had there never been so much exploration and discovery. When Bartholomew Diaz rounds the Cape of Good Hope in 1487, Botticelli is helping to paint the Sistine Chapel in Rome. In 1506, Columbus dies impoverished, forgotten, still believing he discovered the coast of Asia. And the same year, Bramante begins to build St. Peter's in Rome. In 1513, Balboa crosses the Isthmus of Panama to reveal the existence of the Pacific, and Machiavelli publishes The Prince. Raphael dies in 1520 when Magellan is sailing around the world and a rebellion is gathering in Germany around a monk named Martin Luther a rebellion which would soon burst into the Reformation. And in the 1530s, while Pizarro is conquering Peru, Erasmus and Rabelais are in full bloom. While Michelangelo is painting his last judgment on the altar wall of the Sistine Chapel. 
The Renaissance and the Age of Discovery were two peaks of achievement, one of imagination, the other of action. But did they have anything in common? Is it possible to say that Erasmus wrote and Raphael painted and Bartolomeo Diaz ventured past the Cape of Storms in obedience to a similar impulse? And was this impulse derived from some common experience? a way of thinking, an approach to living that historians have agreed to call the European Renaissance. Did the urge to discover new lands grow from the intellectual ferment of the Renaissance? And what effect did the broadening of geographical horizons have on the mental horizons of the people at home? The first thing we can say is that human nature did not change, but the scope of human aspirations was increased by greater material possibilities. By the 1480s and 90s, Europe had developed an agricultural base, an industrial capacity, a superiority in arms and a skill in sailing the oceans that enabled it to explore the rest of the globe, to conquer and loot and colonize it for the next four centuries in a way that the greediest ancient Roman would have envied. Many of the material things that made this exploration possible, however, came out of the Middle Ages. The magnetic compass was adopted by 1187. Sea charts and pilot books were available after 1280. And the ships and the guns that explorers used were not developed by Renaissance intellectuals, but by craftsmen. And just as the means of exploration developed out of the Middle Ages, so did the motives behind it. This is the reception of Columbus by Ferdinand and Isabella. They and other rulers were interested in gold and silver to supplement dwindling sources at home and in slaves and in spices from the East, which were necessary in the first place to preserve food, which spoiled fast in the ages before refrigeration, and then quite simply to make lousy food eatable, tough and stringy meat from skinny cattle, tasteless vegetables, unappetizing and often spoiled food in general. But this spice trade was threatened by the advance of a new Muslim power, the Turks, who took Constantinople in 1453 and the Balkans as well, thus upsetting the commercial balance of the Mediterranean. Before that, Italy had enjoyed a near monopoly of the spice trade for several centuries, which was the source of much of its prosperity. So the countries of Western Europe sought to outflank the Turks and the Italians as well. France, Spain, Portugal, England and the Netherlands all saw the possibilities of sailing south or sailing west to reach the East Indies and they had the means to do it. Another motive universally expressed and quite widely believed was the desire to extend Christianity. And here too, the age of discovery did not see something new, but the redirection of an earlier medieval motive, which had linked conquest and gain with missionary enthusiasm in the Crusades, which Europe had sent out since the 11th century. This crusading ideal had declined precipitously, but it was revived by the advance of the Turks in the southern and eastern Mediterranean and by the fall of Constantinople. And it was maintained by the war against the Moors in Spain, which only ended significantly in 1492. 
at which point the Spanish crown finally gave Columbus permission to sail. The most Renaissance aspect of discovery lay in the cooperation between the crown, geographical experts, and highly educated merchants out for profit, but also very curious and increasingly well informed. And we can find aspects of a new mentality among seamen and travelers as well. We find it in a Venetian called Cadamosto, who said that he joined the Portuguese sailing down the African coast in 1455 and 1456 in order to see interesting sights. And we find it in another Italian, Antonio Pigafetta, who joined Magellan's expedition 60 years later to experiment, he said, and go and see with my own eyes a part of those things we have heard so much about. And finally, we find it in the great explorers themselves who were not just leaders and seamen, but who had to visualize their undertaking within the context of an emerging knowledge of the world as a whole, testing the hypotheses of medieval geography and developing them into a new science altogether, as we shall see in our next program. Funding for this program is provided by Annenberg CPB to advance excellent teaching. For information about this and other Annenberg CPB programs, call 1-800-LEARNER and visit us at www.learner.org.